Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we're playing as that there, Kingdom of England, which has been bombed out and pretty much destroyed because it is 1964, and we have just gotten Harold Super Mac Macmillan in office. Cool. So like I said, I already got the Civil War done, which actually was pretty darn easy actually, and then we've already gone through elections, whether we want with Macmillan or Thatcher, but I did, as you can see on screen, ask in my community poll, who should we play, Speer? Or Macmillan, and for now, it is going to be Papa Macmillan. But let us begin with victory for United England. It would seem the royal party has fallen far from the glory days indeed, for despite every foul attempt at deceit thrown our way, it is not Margaret Thatcher who won the elections. For two decades, a royal party member was PM, but those days are over, for it was United England who won the elections under the leadership of the new Prime Minister Reginald Moulding. Or modeling. A noted liberal and party chairman, Harold Macmillan, United England, shall bring the nation the reforms it requires to survive in an ever changing world. The gross corruption and nepotism of the royal party will not be tolerated. We will reform England root and stem into a nation our children will be proud to call home. Very good. Also, uh, we actually have a little bit of a deficit too, so we don't have to And you can see, I literally just finished out the Civil War because I didn't even move my divisions yet. So, um, you know, as much as I like these guys. We might want to have them on the border between us and uh, a certain nation to our north. Because uh, we might be removing some people eventually. So, fast planner. Ooh, unyielding defender. It's not bad, but I want to be offensive. I want to be very, very offensive. Aggressive assaulter would be nice. Uh, how many more slots? You've got one more slot. Uh, defender's nice. Just max planning. Let's get max planning. Cool. So, oh boy. United England's inner politics. Oh, crap. And we also have high command, which we can talk about a little later on. Uh, loyalty and stuff like that, but... Two factors that influence the state of the UE. Support and democratization. Support determines if Macmillan or Maudling have the most sway in the organization. Democratization is how far the people have come to accept democracy. With a low percentage meaning apathy, while a high percentage means the public is highly involved in and supportive of a democratic society. For the Macmillan, it's very high. Versus for the Libs, which uh, I believe is Maudling. So, oh my goodness, look at all the options we have here. Oh, and we just finished election season. As, as you can see... This is how the election season went. It actually was pretty darn close between us and uh, <laughs> Thatcher, so that wasn't super easy, but whatever. Alright, so how do we spend our PP? Uh, liberals will gain 1% more influence, add more civvies. Oh, what, uh, what is this? Colors here? Huh. We do have 119 political power, though. So we want Macmillanist, who support determines organization. We want more Macmillanist democratization. Uh, oh, let's see. Is that 10%? So, okay. This state's monthly domestic job growth will be increased by 0.01%. Macmillan supporters will gain 3% and more. Okay. Liberalize the economy. Well, let's do that one. I th the liberals, I think, are over here. Macmillan is, of course. So, we don't want the liberals to do too well. We're like conservative or something like that. So, protect the English system. Oh, we can regre regress democratization. Use the liberals. More influence. Progress more de democratization. More influence. Um, remembers the dangers of, of dudism. And, okay, cool, not bad. Do you have anything here? Ooh, industrial. I kind of want to do some of this stuff. Poverty rate will get better. I don't mind doing that and then doing that, but we don't have enough PP. I mean, I'm, we're spending like crazy for like civilian spending and stuff like that. And actually, I didn't even do my land auction for the Civil War. The last Civil War for the government is, you know, if you know what you're doing, really not that bad. So, we actually have, like I said, we have a deficit going. Our GDP growth is god awful, but in time, it should go okay. It really should go okay. Award the police. Liberalize the economy. I love civvies, but I don't think it's really worth doing it for now. Ooh, democratization. Ooh, we, oh, we clean up the party. We lose stability. I really don't want to lose stability right now. A united England. There always be an England slurred Macmillan after his, um, uh, how many rounds of brandy? And England shall be free, shouted Maudling, stumbling over the table and nearly knocking the whole thing over. They didn't quite have the courage to finish the rest of the lyrics, but they had gotten the most important parts. For, after all, their party, United England, had emerged victorious over the dirty fascists in the RP. An enormous burden was lifted from Macmillan's chest. He felt he could breathe again and see again everything was clear to him in that hazy smoking room as clear as a corvoisier in his glass. Now, he had the power to reshape England however he liked, and by Jove, he would do it. Macmillan watched modeling, slump into a leather chair and cozy up. The old boy was English at heart and English in nature. Nobody could ever doubt that, but did he really have the stomach for what was going to come next? What Macmillan would have, would have to do to prevent fascism from ever rising again wasn't going to be pleasant for everyone. He continued to stare at his erstwhile ally and took a brief sip. Tomorrow's problems, but today we shall enjoy. Yet, inside, it's divided as ever. United England is unfortunately not a single party, but rather it is an amalgamation of two different distinct groups who are both dissatisfied with the status quo under the ro royal party. 
First are the Libs, who normally lead United England, the furthest left allowed under real party rules, the Liberals desire a return to the glory days of English democracy, where every man had his vote, and he didn't have only one option to vote for. By contrast, the current majority of the party aren't loyal to the Liberal ideals so much as they are to the person of the chair party. Harold Daddy Macmillan. Above all else, Macmillan desires the utter obliteration of fascism in England, but whatever, whatever, wherever, whether he can continue to work with the liberals, to do so is still the question. Can we work with liberals? Maybe. We'll see what happens. Uh, democracy station. Is that good? Do we want to become more democratic? That seems like more of a more liberal thing to do, right? So, really, I guess we're here with Papa Macmillan. Liberalism, meh. Uh, that's not too bad to get either the chance to get one of these factors. I kind of like that. I just want to... Ooh, loyal to improve. I like that as well. Improve mildly. All right. But we don't have the libs for that. But uh, I, I definitely want one of these things. Industrial equipment seems like a really good thing to grab. I think we'll probably grab poverty. I want to get ba poverty better just because... Uh, okay, so we're here. Zero, zero. Ah, minus 0. 0.75. That's not very good. Ooh, and, uh, industrial expertise is bad. We're not going to do this too often. It's only 3% more support. So we're back at where we started, which is not bad at all. Not bad, right? But meet the chairman, perhaps? No, let's meet the prime minister first. <clears throat> Reginald Modling has long been a firebrand of liberal and English politics, protected as he was by the influence of the reformist faction of the royal party. Modling was one of the more vocal government critics, and his image stuck in the minds of the people for this. Perhaps then it was no surprise that nobody else could lead a party seeking to restore England's glory days. Macmillan might have the majority of the party on his side, but he does need modeling for the moment. <clears throat> Still, should Modling secure his position as PM, he would institute the reforms promised and more. For when you look across England, there's nobody else who has the ability whilst also being acceptable to the current establishment. Very true. Remember the dangers of fascism? Ah, we're okay for now. Not bad, 1.25. That's actually not too bad. Meet the PM, but then we're going to meet the chairman. Some of the more stupid call Harold Macmillan a coward for being one of the architects of the English surrender. Those men are fools. The party chairman acted as he did, not because he wished for the current situation to arise, but because alternative was seeing England bombed into oblivion and its youth slaughtered in pointless battles for petty politics. Can't wait. Harold Macmillan will do anything to see that never comes to pass again. But whilst he has influence over United England... He wouldn't mind some revenge against those who used the capitulation of England to their own advantage to acquire wealth and power. The former royal party may have been his allies, but they were never his friends. Perhaps things can be different with modeling. Maybe. We'll see. Meet the PM, Reginald Modeling? Oh, why not? Reginald Modeling has always been a pain. Most principled people are, really. Modeling was never one to give up a dead idea, including that of England. Though officially affiliated with the royal party since the breakup, no one could ever really say that his allegiance was with the government rather than his friend Macmillan, and so, due to Macmillan's power, no one was going to, willing to get rid of him. <clears throat> Instead, the dreamer stuck around, obsessed with his ridiculous dream of restoring something that had already been lost, or had it. For when the English Civil War came, the German Civil War along with it, there had been a brief window for England to break away entirely and become truly free again. And while modeling sided with Macmillan again and stayed with the government, he still sees this window as wide open. Now his task is to ensure that a free England, one with true democracy and the rights for the people, is fully restored. While he is willing to pay any price for it, including another war with any German interventionists, he is not willing to compromise on that essential freedom for England. The only question is, can he convince the chairman? Well, Macmillan has plans of his own, and they, took, and they look very different from modeling's fever dream. Whatever price is necessary to achieve democracy. Now, I'm kind of wondering, I'm kind of wondering guys. Would you like to see a uh, modeling run as well? Because we're currently going to go for Macmillan as much and as fast as possible. But, you know, I'd, I'd like to know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Since we already here, we're already here. I have the save ready to go if, if needed, maybe for now or for later. So, it's always good to save your games. Usually. Actually, is the High Command's influence... No, nah, it's still pretty much the same. It is what? 46.1%. Oh. Loyalty will be 40... Oh, it's going down. Well, that's not good. The, oh, the command, the base is that much. Okay, so actually for this one, let's raise up our uh, efficiency first because it's 48%. It'll keep going down until we get to like 50%. So uh, let's raise our efficiency. So now the base is going to be 52.5%, which is fine. Meet the chairman, Harold Macmillan. Macmillan was never one for rash action, but neither was he one for backing down in a crisis. <clears throat> when his country called in the Great War, he went. 
He was wounded in that war three times serving the Grenadier Guards and was lucky not to be killed in it. While he was too old to fight in the Second World War, he fought from the bench, railing against appeasement and avoidance of the conflict that had, had to come eventually. When the conflict did come, Britain lost after the invasion and the fall of London. Macmillan realized that the situation was impossible and patient as ever. He knew that the time to cut England's losses and move forward. This meant untold humiliation for a nation not used to it. But that was better than what he had experienced in the Great War. One can live with humiliation. One cannot live whilst being bombed and shelled and shot and mined. So he organized the surrender with Monty and Mountbatten and the rest. This allowed him a strong position in the RP, being an official collaborator. He never liked that label and came rather close to defecting entirely during the English Civil War yet again. The time was not right, or was it? This most careful of decisions turned into one of his greatest personal failings as the horrors of the German Civil War stretched on without end. This was indeed the glowing, golden and glowing window for England to assert her independence once more. But this is no time to cry over spilled milk. The party, nay, the country needs a leader. Someone who will ensure that fascism is squashed while our New England and our England shall be free. But what price and freedom will the country have to pay to secure its freedom under Supermac? Whatever price is necessary, whatever the means... Parliament opens. Elections are always times of great reflection for the political classes. Knowing what your constituents saw fit to elect you despite whatever dirt your opponent threw your way is certainly a great morale booster for the newly elected old guard alike. This opening of Parliament, however, looks to be more interesting than most as the two, important, mo two most important men in England, in a united England, talk of their visions for the nation's future. Harold Macmillan, the party chairman, looks to set to aggrandize his vision of an England secure from the threat of fascism and corruption, whilst PM Reginald Maudling seems likely to address the matters of the flaws in the current Democratic Critic system and its solutions. Whomever the party shall pay more attention to, however, is not certain. Uh, line with his wounds. Personal negotiations, and that's why we may be able to, be able to bring to the table Prime Minister, said the, the Liberian Ambassador. So does that sound like a good or decent trade deal? Rubber and food stuff for furious consumer goods? Modeling tries to look behind the Ambassador so soup, surreptitiously to see what Macmillan thought. He was in the back behind the Ambassador, officially preparing his notes for a conference after this this about parting Party organi organi organizing. Oh my goodness. My apologies for my mispronunciations. Macmillan subtly gave modeling the thumb up. Approval. Well, Ambassador, I think you can get us to agree to such a deal. The Ambassador was pleased. Thank you, Prime Minister. So, when would a potential trade deal such as this one come before Parliament? I'm not sure, Maudling said, trying to see what Macmillan was signaling him. Maybe the next month? Macmillan pointed his finger up. No, wait, we have some urgent legislation to take care of. How about two months? Macmillan raised his finger. I mean, three? Macmillan gave the OK sign. The Ambassador turned to see what Maudling was looking at. Macmillan noticed this and turned his head around as well. Did you notice that weird light reflection, Prime Minister? asked Macmillan. I did, but it's gone now said modeling shrugging so three months then mr ambassador and then we can have a vote in the meantime do you think our little people can hash out the details how long must we keep this act up oh, i like this one not dealing with unification or sea line oh 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 wait, who won the civil war in germany i don't know but whatever it would be fair to say that english economy has seen better days the forceful dissolution of the united kingdom has left england without colonies without better access to any trading to many trading partners and bereft of much of our economic prestige so which so bolstered our income previously England did seem to recover somewhat in the aftermath of the war, as early as the 1950s were a time of relative prosperity. Yet the collapse of the German economy dealt a blow to the fragile status quo from which it almost could not recover. We were left with massive debts and little way to effectively fund many of our vaunted institutions. Finally, the English Civil War caused immense amounts of destruction, which we are still rebuilding from, but now, England has stern leadership at her head once more. With luck, we can put our past behind us. Nice. The opening parliament, the Speaker of the House's voice blared out again from the chair. The Prime Minister, modeling, stood and took his place at the despatch box. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I say what it is an honor it is to be present here at the restoration of our representative democracy at a time when a party that wishes to see that democracy continue is in power. Applause from the government side, disapproving hisses from the opposition. And may I say how grateful I am to our chairman for his assistance in this time of great trouble and toil and for bringing us out on the other side. I am sure he'll agree with me that this opening is a momentous event, and that one that is cause for joy and celebration. I am sure that he is as confident as I am that English democracy, an institution of hundreds of years, will soon be fully restored. And I, and I am also sure that in the coming days, both parties can cooperate on many issues, like foreign policy and trade, as well as restoring a country economically through ambitious domestic programs. We can surely make England into what it once was, a respected power in the world and a prosperous nation at home. Modeling went on for some time. Macmillan merely waited in smiled. He was glad to be in the shadow of modeling. It gave him space and time, both of which were desperately needed to be imp to implement what he knew what would achieve what modeling had spoken of. Macmillan prevails, or modeling? Macmillan, for now, because he's on the thumbnail, right? Uh, so now our base is at 40. Um, current loyalty is 44.4. Ooh, if we do this... Ah, that does... That's okay. 
So now our our base loyalty is currently oh forty five percent. Oh, that doesn't seem very good, but whatever. Because I still want to focus on this stuff too. So better machines. Yeah, we definitely want to get better machines next. Seventy democratization. Very cool. Oh what? Oh wow, the protect England. Macmillan supporters gain three percent more influence. Democratization gets goes lower. Okay, every own state our support increases. That's kind of cool. Another problem. Uh oh. Uh oh. The new oh. Never another sea line. Quentin McGarrow Hogg was working late that night again. The Foreign Office had so much to do these days, trying to figure out who was in charge of Germany, ascertaining the situation in South Africa, and guessing what the heck was going on in Eastern Europe. And this task had to be accomplished as the nation was falling apart again. The minister asked an aide as he opened the door, revealing the busy workplace outside. Sorry to interrupt, but Scotland denounced us. Hogg looked up from his work. What are they saying? They're refusing to recognize us as the legitimate government of England. All diplomatic efforts have been suspended, and a strict embargo has been placed on us. Hogg thought that over. What's the difference from from before? The aide shrugged. I'm not really sure. It's not like they were friendly with us to begin with. All right, then, Hogg said as he went back to the work. They'll pretend we're a legitimate state and we'll continue not to pretend that they are. That's at least one thing that's consistent. He picked up his cup of coffee and realized something peculiar when he put it to his lips. Actually, while you're here, could you give me another cup? Something had something else to keep worrying about. The English trade? I like this. I like trade. Uh, work with the OFN. Ooh! Ooh, choose Baker's plan? Do we... Ooh, military loyalty and efficiency goes down. Oh, I don't know if we can go this way. I think we have to go with our own way. Because this... Well, if we go play modeling, then we'll go down this way. Never another sea line is the way we probably have to go. So, lesson from 1943. Oh, my goodness. Hold on. Before we make any other decisions here... Oh, okay. So, oh, oh, please don't go, don't let Goring win. Oh, no. Can I send volunteers? I mean, there's no guarantee that even Goring wins that it'll attack us. But... You never know. Hmm... Use our history. Oh, that's not good. I don't like that. Well, English industry. Let's get some more cities and infrastructure. Oh, how the memories of happier times distorted our views of the present. There was an era where the first and most powerful industrialized nation was England when we ordered and ha when we ordered and half the globe obeyed our whims. The Second World War crushed that dominance so thoroughly that it's unlikely to ever come back in our lifetimes, perhaps not ever. English industries in the present day is something that of a haphazard state of half-life, with factories shutting down seemingly weekly and unemployment rising like a growing tide. The English Civil War did not help matters whatsoever, with almost half as much destruction as the Second War, Second World War again being wreaked upon an industrial base. We must calm the workers, repair the factories, and get the English industrial complex back in business. England moves on. Months have passed times or had passed since the horrors of war, had scarred the minds of the English people and the landscape of the country. Many a city and several towns had found themselves lying in ruins nearby. The vast swaths of once tranquil countryside helplessly bore witness to tragedies of the darned war. Not a single corner of any field or street had avoided the damage caused, and underneath what had endured, a deep mistrust was felt throughout. Yet the sounds of war which had so hunted the lives of every Englishman has indeed duly faded. Much of the rubble had by, had by this stage been removed, and foundations for a new England has been built in its place. Unfortunately, the paranoia remained below the surface, but in typical English fashion, that too seemed to have passed at a glance. If one were to glance at the New England, they would have to thought of it quite similar to what had been before utterly clueless to the terrible the country had seen not so long ago. A new era was undoubtedly upon them, and from the ruins of what remained, an altogether different England had been constructed. Soon, its grander ambitions would be rekindled, and England would grow and flourish once more. However, most of those who had been dragged through the overarching panic that had seized every aspect of their lives could only hope, living on and hoping that they could move on and leave their sorry past behind. May these times be better than the last. So we had a reconstructing England, which is god-awful. That's killing our stability. GDP growth. It's just good to get rid of this. Of a promising future, too. We have a medium conservative bias. Government stability, not bad. I kind of like that. We get more daily political power gain. And we also have the state of the English military. Not very good, but not really super important to do right now. But nice. And it's gone. Let's take a look. Not terrible. Hey, we actually have some sort of growth. Great. The slogan to remake England. Reginald Modeling wrapped his brain for a snappy slogan and came up empty. It wasn't for lack of trying. He'd been working without sleep for days, coordinating with the Whitehall bureaucrats on the various details of the government's new economic plan. The result was a hundred-page behemoth that defied easy description, encompassing everything from the mechanizing English agriculture, investing in English science, and investing in the industrial heartlands. But the details were for and for for the bureaucrats. From and for the bureaucrats. Now modeling had to sell it to Parliament and to the people. He had no doubt that if implemented fully, his plan would transform England, freeing it from two decades of stagnation. If nothing else, their numbers would look impressive coming from a low base, but the English people see, would see a country rebuilt from ashes, the return of dignified work, and the restoration of prosperity. The English people would dare to dream again to look at the world with something other than survival in mind, to know that the country, restored to greatness, would grow still greater. A land of hope and glory? That's it. A land of hope and glory. 
Uh, the line will roar again. I like this. I want to get as many jobs growth as possible. And then to protect England is good and all, but we already have quite a bit of support. The backbench liberals. Here we go again. I want to do the English economy. Yes. I want more jobs. Gotta be nice to have a job. But economically, England isn't doing as bad as it could be, given the poor circumstances we find ourselves in. In fact, or in fact, Given that we are recently in a civil war of epic proportions, it's amazing that our economy is functioning at all. Regardless, Reginald Maudling and Harold Macmillan intend to use a relatively clean slate that the aftermath of the conflict presents to make some reforms. This will be a tricky prospect, as the issues we face are deeply ingrained into the way of life. The average Englishman leads at the moment, issues like low employment and, for and low foreign investment compared to similar nations around the world being amongst the least of our worries. However, United England is a government of competence, and with our steady hand at the wheel, England will march forward. Absolutely. Uh, this stuff is all nice. Factories are nice and all, but I want societal progress. So, we gotta get that societal progress. Thank you very much. The English trade? Yes, please. <clears throat> I'll maybe do the, the sea lion ones up there, though. The volatile situation in Germany has opened up opportunities for many English businesses. The Americans may not trust us, but they trust our money enough that they've risen to become our largest trading partner. Inter-Atlantic commerce with our Americans is booming and funding the rejuvenation of our nation to the surprise of many. For all that Germany is wounded by the civil war which was waged across its heartlands, it is not a power which we can ignore by any means. The Germans are the largest holder of English bonds bar none, and no matter our desires we cannot afford at the present time to cease trade with a nation which could potentially collapse our economy at any time it chooses. We shall, have tre we shall tread carefully on this matter. The value of our jobs will increase by a small amount. Very cool. We want more jobs. Jobs for the people, man. Jobs for the people. Nice. Let's grab some more uh, land auction just in case. We keep cutting down the day. It's going to continue increasing, which is going to kind of suck. But that's alright. Better machines, my friends. There you go. 75%. We love it. The line will roar again, though, my friends. Even though I probably want to do the this one. <clears throat> the new British Royal Armed Forces. Nobody's really prepared for a massive insurrection, especially one where a sizable number of our units and officers defect. Our men were forced to fight a difficult campaign across their own countrymen, who are armed and supported by major foreign powers. That we won in the end is a significant credit to the armed forces of England, but none of this excuses poor performance. We may not want to hear it, but we, will, we underperformed in the Civil War. We will find out what went wrong and fix it immediately. Our next enemy will not be a group of insurgents, and we cannot make mistakes when we face them. Honestly, or face him. Um, honestly, I don't think I made mistakes. Like... Oh god, growing one. But, like, okay, so when the Civil War... Actually, oh, I do want to let you guys know. If you play England, and you start off the game, and you can't make equipment, that's that's intentional. That is 100% intentional. Don't worry about that. Um, that's just part of the game. That's literally just part of the game, if you can't make stuff at the beginning. You can occasionally make stuff because of the mechanics in the game, but if you're wondering ever, like, if you're playing England and you're not, you can't make anything, that's totally intentional. That's totally okay. Um, but, like, the Himmler government rose up in Bristol. They rose up around Norwich. And then Northern England, that was it. So I killed off the ones around Bristol, and then Norwich, and then finished off Northern England. So it actually wasn't that bad. So and at least when you play the little game with Himmler and stuff like that, so it wasn't. It, it's just not that bad. It's actually pretty interesting. I'm not gonna hurt stability. That, I'm really not gonna hurt stability with that one. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Sussex, more domestic job growth. We're gonna go for that one next. We have to. Uh, the line will roar again, though. This one too. Party leader Macmillan intends to give a speech to Parliament today. A speech surrounding the state of the English economy, supported by Prime Minister Modeling, the Prime Minister intends. Two, on revealing a new economic plan to guide English growth in the coming years. Though United England has only come to the fore recently, this sort of rapid and seemingly effective action is quickly improving their popularity with otherwise skeptical English upper classes. If Macmillan and Modeling can continue to have this sort of success in the long term, it is quite possible that England won't face significant internal divisions in regards to the economy for years to come. Nice. Very nice. And here we hopefully will go. Uh, which one do we want to do? Is it this one? Yes. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs is a four-letter word. Usually. I could be wrong about that, but I, but sometimes I'm not. The issue of industry. Oh, yeah. Some more jobs. Assessment and debrief. Quite simply, sir, it is a bloody disaster. And I'll shoot whoever says otherwise, declared Field Marshal Templar. I can let caught us with our pants down. Oh boy. The day the war started, our communication systems broke down. We had no idea who was ready, who was not, who was overwhelmed, and who defected. And from what I gather, asked Macmillan, <clears throat> the communication situation never really improved, did it? I'm afraid not, sir, the general said, said General Carver. Communications with our men were a constant difficulty throughout the war. There were many troubles with coordination and awareness, and we performed poorly because of it. This was not helped by the breakdown of organization. Organization? 
cried General Barker. That's the problem. Our lads on the ground had no idea who was in charge, who was in their unit, or even what their orders were. We didn't have anything close to a proper army, sir. Field Marshal Montgomery spoke up. I think that perhaps my colleagues are a bit too negative on our performance. There were plenty of aspects that went well, but regardless, we must uh, do better and prepare for a German invasion. That's surely inevitable, especially with Goring here. There's an aspect we've ignored, said Admiral Power. Naval forces were not necessary in this past war, but if there's a German invasion, the navy will become highly relevant, and we don't necessarily we don't have nearly the ships necessary to defend ourselves at all. Macmillan realized at the moment the totality of the problems in the armed forces. We're not ready. Oh, no, no, we are not ready, my friends. Oh, baby boy. But a legacy of ink and paper. Irena, oh, you know what? Uh, I think this is part of, like, a story. Yeah, this is a story about, like, the woman and stuff. I guess I'll read this one. Irena had a solid routine that kept her sane since the Civil War. After living in her secretary position at a local unemployment office, she'd ride the creaky, rusted, over-bus down to that little village up the north, one which, unlike Birmingham, seemed relatively unscarred by the years of artillery shells. In the misty, cracked roadway in the town south, though, she'd enter Everett's bookshop, the quaint building made of dark oak marked by only its bright green name painted above the entrance. Time to look around for another volume to spend her nights with once the kids were fed and tucked in. After the brief greeting and chatting with old Everett, Irena went over to the world literature section. She perused the shelves like a skilled detective, an eye for any title from her native Poland, knowing that anything she found would likely be at least 30 years old. As she ran her fingers through each section of the towering shelf, she fully expected to come up empty-handed until reaching a toppled over collection to the very bottom level, all in nondescript and red binding. The within these titles were hundreds of pages written in Polish, some so old that she could hardly comprehend it, half of what was being said. Tales of medieval rebels, supernatural battles, and the daily struggles of family life. All memories of a land she could hardly envision since her first arriving on England's shores ten years ago. In an instant, piled up the books and pressed them against her chest, moving carefully over to Everett, calculating in her head to see if she could even afford a collection of with her meager wages. Find any everything you need, Everett said in a nasally ever amicable tone. Reina reply with a yes. That she found exactly what she needed, but that was about 15 pounds short. No worries, love. This looks about as important to your family as a nightly ration package. It's yours, free of charge. With a smile and a statement of absolutely bewildered appreciation, Irena helped Everett fill up a large brown bag, then quickly made her way out of the shop and towards the bus stop. On a distant horizon, the white eagle flies once more. I have read that one before. I, I can confirm that. I definitely read that one before because I remember that happening. But the issue of industry... Bombs, as it turns out, are not good for the continued running and maintenance of factories. Unfortunately for the English industrial sector, the Civil War destroyed a good portion of our industry that worked. And worse, we only had a limited amount after the damages inflicted by the Second World War and the collapse of the German economy. We cannot expect this paucity of the factories to get our economy back in gear, so let us build them ourselves, aside from creating jobs enough to mitigate the matter of unemployment to a degree. We'll also be able to increase our independence in regards to finished technical goods as well. We can set up a task force and some targets to aid these programs in getting off their feet, but in the long term, this will make some self-sufficient industry capable of surviving without her direct supervision. Good. And here, like, okay, I didn't even set up any of these divisions. These were just given to us when the Civil War started. They're not bad. They're not great. Um, I'm, I'm actually a little uh, worried. Uh, I'm just going to do that one. There you go. There you go. That we're going to have a certain little Papa Goring stop or knock on our doorstep. So I'm gonna make a few divisions just because I'm not, I, I I'm a little paranoid about this right now. All but you guys. I don't, I don't even know who these guys are, but that's okay. There you go. There you go. Train. Because I'm worried. I'm worried about it. I'll be honest. Even that hurts the growth. Whatever. Oh, there goes Bennett. And what do we have here? Meet with industrial giants. Oh. Anything else here? Um, Photoshop with the police. Eh. Mildly, huh? Anything else here? Uh, I like that one. I like the civvies. Ooh, jobs, though. Jobs. Oh, screw it. We're going to maximize jobs. Screw everything else. Jobs, 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 and better weapons. We love better weapons, but we love jobs, but we love improving ourselves. Very nice. Open more steel mills. Um, I think... We, oh, we can't... Oh, we need Cornwall. Okay, that's good to know. Oh, wait. Oh, 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 what's over here? Oh, no, there's even more. On the world stage. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I forgot about this stuff. Oh. 
Mm, we need more than 60 military loyalty on the world stage. We can do at least that one. England, once again, emerges onto the world stage as a shadow of its former self, a nation no longer at the center of the world, no longer a dominant mover in world politics, but as a small nation making its first steps out of the shadows. One may expect England to be swamped by a turbulent sea of change and pulled back down into the depths. But England has been in the spot long ago when the world was split between the spheres of influence and a totalitarian dynasty ruled mainland Europe, and the tiny kingdom in the Isles was an afterthought. And with some skillful maneuvering, one may find England as adept as it once was at reclaiming the spotlight. Nice. Jobs, jobs, jobs. For the love of God, give us more jobs. Democratization is still stuck at 10%. That's fine. Totally fine. Nice. There you go. Outdated equipment. Um, what are we using that's outdated? Oh, early motors. That makes sense. Um, we're making some of these ships here. I haven't looked at this at all, I'll be honest, so... Early, this must be a carrier, yeah, it's an aircraft carrier. It's not bad, we have 8 naval XP, but usually the devs actually did really, really well. Like, making really pretty, you know, competent ships, which, I mean, we don't use ships very often here in TNO, but they did a really good job with it. So, great. If we make any more dockyards, though, um, we'll probably want some not basic cruisers. Kind of class, cruisers, no. No. Fiji class, no. Dito class, huh? Uh, what is this? Uh, heavier than destroyer, lighter than that. Uh, this is a that was a hard number, so there you go. Minotaurs. Uh, ooh, that's actually better. So these are disappear disappearing, and then you can get rid of all that stuff. That doesn't really matter. Oopsie. Now let's just go and grab battleships. Battleships. Goodbye. Battleships. Goodbye. Our cruiser. Is this a capital ship? It looks like a capital. Yes, it is. All right. This one is a light cruiser, which eh, is not great, but not bad. Um, for this one, let's go with aircraft capabilities. Ugh, landing pad, that's not bad. Remove, no, we want anti-sub would be actually really good. Anti-air, probably. Yeah, I just get a crap ton of... Oh, actually, there's a different anti-air. No, just because when the enemies start bombing us... Yeah, we definitely going to need it. And that is... Yeah, that's what one's good. Just in case. Sorry, guys, I just... I forgot about that off-screen. The Navy, like... If you know TNO at all, it doesn't really mean too much, but... Open more steel mills. Battleships were once a major destination of English steel, creating titans of the waves which reinforce or power for the world to tremble at. Though we may not be building so many battleships in the modern age, steel is remarkably useful for all kinds of things. Which is why it's a shame there's been a decline in the number of mills producing it. Let us rectify this mistake. Opening up a new series of mills which will make construction projects far cheaper, which has always helped the economy, and the jobs from these endeavors will lift hundreds out of them, unemployment and the poverty associated with it. On the off chance we do need the steel for battleships in the future, though, that w well, that would just be a happy little accident. Nice. Cool. And what do we have down here? Liberalized? No, thank you. Jobs? Yes, please. And we can keep doing this stuff as well. We're at our base, 45, almost 45%. Ooh. 50, like, doing this one is so inefficient, it's not bad. I do want to give it more loyalty, though, right now, but we don't have enough PP for that. Hmm. Mildly increase. Well, after this, invest in, ooh, agriculture? Yes, we're going to do agriculture next. All right, let's come over here. We're looking pretty good on technology. And we'll grab more max factories in the state. We're doing quite well. Quite well. Hey, 40 billion in GDP? Not bad, my friends. After this, let's invest in agriculture. The core of the English economy might have always been industry, but agriculture in the aftermath of the wars played a significant part as well, as we cannot expect to always be capable of importing crops at reasonable prices in these times. It falls to the government to invest in the agricultural sector to ensure that no matter what happens across the globe, the English people always have their meat and veggies on the table. There will be other bonuses to these investments beyond the obvious, of course. More farming means more jobs, and ag English agriculture isn't quite so mechanized as of that of foreign nations, which might not do all that much for efficiency, but it means there's more work to be done. With some careful timing, we might even be able to export some crops to interested parties. You never know. Jobs? Uh, no. No more jobs for now. Oh, actually, mo loyalty will increase. Do we have the loyalty one? Yeah, let's do loyalty. I like loyalty. And our loyalty now is at this. It's 55.7, and the base is 50. So we get a little bit more PP. We get over two a day. Wow, that's really nice. And we'll continue raising our loyalty a little bit more. That'll be good to do. We have five army XP, which is not bad. Let's go ahead and make these guys at least 20 combat with. Are we out of guns? Yo, G, no. We just need way more artillery then. Guns looking a-okay. Artillery not looking good. Eh, go back up to two. That's it. There you go. 
And loyalty. Nice. Now the base is 55. Um, yeah, that's not, that's not terrible. And next, we shall do expand coal mines. More jobs, more cities. Forget oil, coal is a black gold that England needs in these trying times. Something that can be used easily domestically. Sent overseas and stored for long periods with no issues. That already provides a great many jobs for people throughout our nation. Coal will do could be well one of the saviors of the English economy given time. And our expanding the mines will in the long term add a not insignificant income to our coffers. As in all things, however, some caution is key. We ought to be careful that coal doesn't take over a super majority of our economy like it did to the Welsh. Leaving us vulnerable to the economic tides that are so rarely stay still. If we keep production streamlined, we should have a few decades left on the most of the mines at a minimum, and decades worth of jobs are always useful. Always, always useful. Ah, military austerity. No, spend. Ooh, ooh mm. I do want to cut it some more, but even if we don't cut it, we still have a deficit. I think it's okay to cut it for now. It's not that much of better, but it's okay to cut it for now, I think. But, find an unemployment, but where? Oh, boy. To protect England. I uh, get more stability, which is good to get, actually, so... Uh, let's do it. Protect England. In times of crisis, it is not the idealists we look to for comfort. Men are not comforted by petty words, or pretty words, nor are they comforted by ideals. It is action and experience which keeps the people calm and focused upon their own lives, the knowledge that they will not have to do anything, for the experts will take care of the problem. That is what Harold Macmillan offers England. When the liberal elements of our party buckle, Harold Macmillan will stand fast. Should the skies darken with approaching aircraft, the people will be able to retreat to pre-built shelters rather than their basements. Should the wolves at our door come knocking, they will not find weakness in England, for Macmillan will sacrifice anything and everything for the protection of our people. Nothing else is acceptable. What else we got down here? Jobs? Ah, jobs! Nice. Not bad, my friends. And after that, we will go ahead and... We'll, we'll do this one eventually. Yeah, I kind of want to do that now. Oh, shit, what else do we have around here? So this is the entire focus tree for now. We can't do anything on the right side. So, a New England? Oh, uh, we could probably do that one, actually. Forget everything you know about England. A nation merely a puppet of the Reich? No longer. The spineless traitors who bend over backwards to Hitler to protect their property and pompous titles? They lost the election. The fascists who serve only as Germany's boot on Britannia's neck? They are now further from war than power than any time after the war. United England's England is a country that strongly abhors any sort of Nazism. It will go out and reclaim England's greatness and forge bonds both new and old. No longer do we cower in the shadow of Adolf Hitler. For now we look the nations of the world right in the eyes. And let's do another one, too. Immediately. Fight on unemployment, but where? The great plague of the Earth nation at this moment is unemployment, even more than inflation, as much as it pains some of our members, our government to say so. If our citizens lack jobs, then they cannot contribute to the economy no matter how much money we stuff the economy with. Fixing this will be our next priority. Yet England does not possess enough money to fix everything everywhere, so our efforts will need to be focused if we want them to have proper effect. We could relieve the North, try and get part of their nation once so closely attached to Himmler on our side. The Midlands could do some jobs as well, and support there would be useful for United England. Finally, we could support the South and London, but we could not run economy off a third of its land area, no matter how many votes it has. Regional unemployment. Where to focus? We desperately need to revitalize our struggling economy before any other goals of our government can be achieved. As we already have studied, all three regions have had it rough for some time now. However, we cannot solve all three problems at once. We need to be able to focus our efforts on the place where our programs can do the most good. The North was the hardest hit, even before the war. It'll take some convincing, as the North was a hotbed of resistance prior to the war, but no small part of that resistance was due to a lack of economic programs centered around this porous region. Showing that the government is willing to make amends for the past omissions might go a long way towards shoring up our economy and national unity. It's risky, but the rewards could be very valuable. The Midlands are primarily agricultural, and so our program of industrialization would present a significant change in the overall lifestyle of the region, however. It would also show our commitment to an oft-forgotten region and stamp down Sterlingite sympathies among the population. The South, oh, the good old South, has always been the richest region, owing in no small part to a london centered government. It has also been the least turbulent region, and it was a bulwark of the government during the English Civil War. Our efforts here would be most likely to succeed and would certainly benefit the government standing with the upper classes. However, leaving out the other regions might, be, might sour national unity. Where should we focus the efforts of a new program? The North? The Midlands? The South? Apparently, we just decrease jobs no matter where it is, but I do want to know your opinion. Where should we put our jobs? Or the unemployment focus. The North, Midlands, or South. So with the North, you get some better poverty rate, some infrastructure. With the Midlands, you get some unemployment and the Midlands will decrease. And the rich South, well, you get some more uh, jobs in a military factory. But I want to leave that to you, my friends. What shall we do? Shall we go with the North, Midlands, or South? Let me know in the comments below. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I will see you tomorrow.
in which we will explore and recover more for the in Kingdom of England. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous English rest of your day.